Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jean Hébert. I'm a minister, minister's appointee and chair of uh, the TICO Board of Directors. On behalf of the board, I would like to welcome everyone to our 22nd annual general meeting of the Travel Industry Council of Ontario. You have, uh, and you have in your uh, bag, a copy of the agenda, the minutes, and the annual report uh, that uh, you will maybe have to consult uh, over the, uh, the, the time of the meeting. I would like to call the, uh, the meeting to order and uh, to start uh, that meeting, uh, we have, uh, I, I would like to introduce the uh, current members uh, of the board of directors and would, I would ask uh, each of you to stand up when I uh, call you. So I will start with the uh, three Cato appointees uh, and maybe introduce yourself. Uh, the first one, Brett Walker, who is also the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors. Brett is a General Manager at the Collette uh, Vacation. Probably you know, uh, you, you all know him. Nicole Bercy. Nicole? Nicole is a Commercial Director at Transat. Rick Edwards. Richard, Richard Edwards. Richard is Controller at the uh, Travel Corporation Canada. Uh, the two ACTA uh, appointees, Mike Forster. Mike is uh, president of Nexion Canada in London. Louise Gardiner, Louise, the, uh, from Kitchener. One OMCA appointee, uh, Jim Debo, who is, uh, couldn't make it today. Jim is from Hanover and uh, is the president of Hanover Holiday Tours. And uh, we also have three elected uh, members, directors of the board, uh, Marc Patry. Marc is from Ottawa, uh, director of CNH Tours. Scott Stewart, where is Scott? Scott, Scott is president of uh, G. Stewart Travel Services Limited in uh, Peterborough. Robert Thompson, who is president of Total Advantage Travel and Tours Inc. in Toronto. Uh, Robert couldn't make it today. Uh, now the uh, appointees by the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. We have uh, on the board Katera Agbari, who is also absent today. Uh, Warren Kanagaratnan, uh, who is also uh, absent. Uh, we have here with us Jan McMillan, where is Jan? Is from uh, Sault Ste. Marie, and uh, Lorraine Nowina from Toronto. Finally, I would like to introduce our leadership team, uh, starting with Dorian. Everybody know, know, knows Dorian, who is the uh, VP operation, and uh, Tracy McKernan, who is the um, legal counsel and uh, corporate secretary, and uh, our CEO, President and CEO of TICO, Richard Smart. Uh, in the audience, we also have other members of the uh, leadership team, senior management, Tim Snell. Where is Tim? Legal counsel and director litig litigation. Sanya Skirbik, Sanya, who is uh, director of finance, financial compliance. Tony Aramuni, Tony, is there. Tony is information technology. And uh, I would also like I would also like to introduce our new uh, stakeholder relations manager, um, Christina Wilson. Where are you, Christina? Okay, right there. Now um, we have also special guest uh, with us today. But in fact, from the industry uh, and from the ministry, I will start with the uh, representatives from the ministry. We have Michel Sanborn, who is, uh, can you 
Stand up, Michel, uh, just for the people to see you, who is Assistant Deputy Minister, uh, Policy Planning and Oversight Division. We also have Kelly Houston Rootley, who is Director of Consumer Policy and Liaison Branch. Anna Tinta. Anna is Manager uh, for DAA uh, Policy and Oversight Unit. Linnell, Linnell? Linnell Dos Santos, yes. <laughs> Senior Policy Advisor, uh, DA Policy and Oversight Unit. Lisa Kingsmore, Lisa is Senior Policy Advisor as well, uh, in the same uh, uh, direction, Policy and Oversight uh, Unit. From ACTA, we have uh, Wendy Paradi, who is the President of ACTA. We also have Fiona Bowen, Membership Manager at ACTA. From Quito, we have the Executive Director, Pierre Lepage. Pierre, welcome. <laughs> and the uh, former CEO and uh, Registrar, uh, Michael Pepper. Michael. And also from our uh, uh, marketing firm, TAG, uh, we have the president of the, uh, the firm, Fabio Orlando, and his team. Welcome, Fabio. Uh, Fabio. Now, we move to uh, item two on the uh, agenda, which is the uh, proof of notice of the meeting. And uh, I have to confirm, to confirm uh, that the notice of the meeting was properly uh, given, and I uh, have a certificate of service of notice from the corporate secretary uh, indicating that the notice of the meeting was given 30, 30 days prior to the meeting, which satisfies uh, our bylaws. Now uh, I need to call for scrutinies uh, for the uh, election that will take place later on, could I have a motion to nominate four scrutineers that are responsible for counting the number of votes when, when needed? I need a motion. Sure. Motion moved by Ian McMillan to appoint <coughs> Margaret Campbell, Suzanne Deer, Suzanne Yanko, and Sanya Kerbeck as scrutineers, and I need a seconder, seconded by Scott Stewart. So no more uh, proposal. So I will uh, declare those uh, uh, person scrutineers uh, acclaimed. Now, uh, determination of the quorum. Uh, in order to determine the uh, the quorum that we have the quorum today at, at this uh, meeting, uh, could you uh, please, uh, voting members, uh, raise your voting cards? Yeah. Okay. So. The quorum is uh, 20. I can confirm that we have the quorum for this uh, meeting. So I now declare, declare the meeting properly constituted. I will have to go through the uh, rules of procedure for a few moments uh, for this uh, uh, general meeting. And uh, those rules have not changed over the years. They are, uh, all, well, they are all the same. And uh, the first one is that uh, each member is entitled to one vote in person or by proxy for each registration held on every question submitted. The branch offices do not receive a vote, only head offices. Voting shall be conducted by a show of voting cards. The declaration of an outcome by the chair shall be recorded in the minutes and shall be conclusive evidence of the fact 
numbers, percentages, abstentions, and the identity of those opposed may but do not need to be recorded. A vote of the majority of those voting shall be required in order that a motion pass unless the law or bylaws requires a greater number. In the case of an equality of votes, the chair shall have a casting vote. The chair has the right to limit to one the number of times an individual can speak on one issue. Persons entitled to be present uh, are the members, the officers and audit auditors of the corporation and members of the public. People speaking for the first time should please introduce uh, yourself. We will now move on the uh, item uh, three, uh, which is the, uh, on your agenda, which is the uh, minutes of the uh, last meeting in June 2018. And uh, you have a copy in your bag and uh, does anyone have uh, any discussion, discussion, discussion points arising from those minutes? If not, uh, the minutes are considered approved. And uh, now uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our uh, guest speaker, uh, Mrs. Sanborn, who is, as I mentioned earlier, the Assistant Deputy Minister. And uh, we are fortunate to have the presence of uh, Madame Sanborn today. Uh, earlier, uh, I would say a couple of weeks ago, Minister Walker had confirmed that he will be present at our AGM. But as you know, uh, the cabinet shuffle uh, uh, it is what it is, and uh, the new minister, Thompson, had a discussion with uh, her office, and for sure, after a week uh, being appointed as new minister of this uh, big ministry, uh, it was difficult for her to be with us today, but we have this uh, fortunate uh, uh, responses, a response from Madame Sanborn. So Madame S uh, Mrs. San Sanborn has over 25 years uh, of experience within the Ontario Public Service. Her senior leadership roles have included policy development, operational service delivery, corporate management, and agency oversight and ac accountability. Most recently, she led the uh, Condo Reform Initiative and the creation of governments newest administrative authorities. She spent over a decade in the Ministry of Health and Long-Term care, care, leading a number of policy and program priorities to improve service delivery in the healthcare sector. So we are grateful that Mrs. Sanborn has taken time today uh, to, uh, to uh, join us. And I'd like to invite you up to the stage to say uh, a few words. I thought there was a step there. So, uh, merci Jean, merci, bienvenue tout le monde. So, my name is Michelle Sanborn, and I am the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Policy Planning and Oversight Division. A key thing that our division does is work extensively with administrative authorities. Um, so we have 12 that we work with, and this really is AGM season. So we're out um, and about. I think this is our third one. We have another one tomorrow. And it's a wonderful opportunity to really interact, to hear from you, um, and to really see what is behind um, the, uh, the people that we deal with on a regular basis, Jean and, uh, and, and Richard. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to everyone today. Um, so I really want to thank both Jean and Richard for um, inviting us today. I'm really glad to be here. Um, yes, the minister, our former minister Walker had accepted the invitation and unfortunately 
um, obviously was unable to attend. We did have a cabinet shuffle uh, last week and the minister's only day four in the job. So um, we're just sort of getting her up to speed on everything that we do. Um, but I'm happy to be here. Um, I have had a brief conversation with our new minister, um, Minister Thompson, and um, I think she's really relishing the role. Um, getting to know the administrative authority model and and all of the mandates and how we work together in partnership to deliver these services to the public um, so I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Tico and express the ministry's appreciation for your continued leadership in the field your work promotes a fair marketplace and helps consumers make purchases from travel agents and wholesalers knowing they are protected by Tico as the organization designated to administer the and enforce the Travel Industry Act, TICO has helped create good standards of practice throughout the industry that benefit Ontarians. Your important work governing over 2,300 travel agents and wholesalers has contributed to a fair travel industry in Ontario. I just wanted to touch base on a few of the government priorities and how your work links to that. So the Ministry of Government and Consumer Service is working to support government in achieving its goals, I mean, obviously. Um, this includes strengthening consumer protections for Ontarians and reducing burden on business. So another key piece of work that we do is the Consumer Protection Act. Um, so it's all of the pieces in that act, and we have a, a sister organization that actually is the enforcement arm of that act uh, within the ministry. You may have seen that the budget announced in the 2019 budget that it is undertaking two important initiatives, the digital plan and burden reduction. The digital plan, which was a new uh, law that was introduced, the Simpler, Faster, Better Services Act, will make government work better for Ontarians through the adoption of a digital first approach to service delivery. The government is also focused on reducing regulatory burden across government and for business. This will enable business to better serve their customers and clients in Ontario. And I'm really pleased that TICO is already on its way to supporting these initiatives on both the digital side and the burden reduction side. Um, and they really do have a good uh, digital focus. One of the things the former minister did was kind of write to the administrative authorities and challenge them to support and work with the government on both these initiatives, burden reduction and digital. Um, and we had a really good response uh, from TICO and, and Richard and I had uh, some good conversations about that. So um, I think that TICO was very well positioned to support that agenda. This really shows that TICO is on board in terms of the burden reduction and modernization, in terms of always thinking about how we can innovate and do things better. I wanted to touch base on the Travel Industry Act and the changes that were made in 2017 um, under the former administration. Um, so you may know that there were some changes made to that act, but really to take effect, the regulation under the TIA uh, needs to be developed before the amendments to the act can really be proclaimed. With the change in government and the work that we're doing, um, we will keep TICO uh, up to speed on any future work and we will communicate any work on the regulatory piece uh, once that becomes available. I also wanted to acknowledge the good work that TICO has done recently with uh, our sister administrative authority, the Real Estate Council of Ontario, in identifying ways to address potential overlap in the regulation for short-term accommodation rentals. Um, and actually, this did come up at the RICO AGM um, as a really good piece of work, and I, and I know you were there, so that was great. Um, this really was an excellent example of collaboration between the administrative authorities in pursuit of a solution that really benefits everyone and is very harmonized. Um, finally, I really would like to extend a personal thank you to Richard. Um, for his work on the Collaboration Council. So you, you, you may know there's a Collaboration Council. It's a round table of the CEOs of all the administrative authorities. And Richard has uh, been chairing that uh, and done a great job over the past year. So um, thank you, Richard, for that. Um, and then finally, I, I'm only five months in this position. And I think one of the first calls I had was from Richard, um, welcomed me into the position. And I've had some good 
um, insights from him in terms of the relationship and in terms of how we go forward and work. Um, and so I personally really appreciated that and that, that has been very helpful. But generally, I'd like to thank all of you for inviting the ministry here this afternoon. I know my team is here. I want to thank them um, for all the good work that they do on a day-to-day -day basis between the two organizations um, and for all your hard work and dedication and always trying to really look at how we can do things better you know, for the registrants and, and for the members, but also um, for the public. And I really wish you all the best um, in the coming years. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sanborn. Uh, I can echo your sentiment about the uh, collaboration and of uh, and working towards uh, enhancing consumer protection and uh, while we are we also have to consider reducing burden uh, on inter on Ontario's travel uh, agencies and website uh, Tico enjoys a positive working relationship and uh, with the ministry and I would like to make uh, to take a, a moment to thank you all uh, the ministry staff who are also with us uh, today. Your presence is uh, very uh, appreciated. Um, now um, we are we move on the uh, item five of the uh, agenda report uh, reports in fact and I will start with my own report and uh, I'd like to begin to begin my remarks by saying that as chair of TICO Board of Directors, I'm proud of the organization's accomplishment over the past year. The travel industry continues to change at a rapid pace. We continue to see technological advances and the borderless nature of online sales means we are clearly operating in a global environment. The travel industry here in Ontario has seen further consoli consolidation and pressure from global competition. I'll take uh, f the next few minutes to highlight a few important initiatives where the Board of Directors has provided effective ins oversight <coughs> in discharging its uh, responsibilities. Let me first uh, say uh, it's been another very busy year for the TICO board. A total of 34 board and committee meetings uh, held uh, throughout the, the year. Uh, I will start with the uh, Audit uh, Risk and Technology Committee chaired by Rick Edwards, uh, who uh, has uh, focused primarily on its fiduciary uh, responsibilities providing insight and guidance over the annual budget, quarterly performance investments, and technology enhancements. This, this committee also oversees uh, the organization commitment to effective risk management, risk mitiga mitigation, and a strong system of internal controls. The uh, governance committee and human resources chaired by Lorraine uh, Luina, Noina, sorry, led several key governance processes aimed at enhancing best practices, including the annual evaluation of the board of directors and succession planning, education, and development of policy review aimed at facilitating an effective operating model and relationship between the board and management. Also, a key role of this committee is strategic workforce planning, ensuring that the organization has optimized its resources for today and the future. The Business Strategy Committee, chaired by Ian McMillan, provided strong oversight over the transition to a fully digital consumer awareness campaign, which you will hear more about later in the meeting. This committee also oversaw the planning and implementation of a strategic partnership between Tico and Olivers, a leader in adult e-learning. This new education platform provides a simpler and most cost-efficient platform for both consumers and Tico. 
This committee also led the ongoing development of evolutions of TICO's strategic business plan and broader stakeholder engagement strategies. The Legislation and Regulatory Modernization Committee, which I, I chair uh, on an interim basis, uh, most part of the year this committee was chair, chaired by uh, Richard Vanderloog. Uh, this committee remains focused on the comprehensive review of the Travel Industry Act and Ontario regulation. This committee has been fully engaged in the regulatory review focusing on issues, options, and considerations involving individual registration, administrative penalties, discipline process, and addressing various financial burden opportunities facing the industry today. More about this important regulatory review uh, will be presented in a moment. Through these committees, the board continues its focus on the most significant challenges and risks facing the organization. Two of these challenges I wish to <coughs> highlight include cybersecurity and the industry financed compensation fund. Cybersecurity is a growing threat to all businesses, and TICO's board is reviewing its role in preparing an appropriate crisis response plan. Stakeholder disclosures and communication protocols in the event of, a such, of such an attack. In terms of the compensation fund, while, while there are no changes expected in the short term in the regulatory re review uh, now underway, the Board of Directors will continue its current oversight with management engagement through open and transparent communications with the industry, government, and other key stakeholders. The modernization of the compensation fund, including how it is funded and the important coverage it provides consumers, remains a key priority. There is nothing perfect, and I think that there is certainly room for improvements in the future. But even with these evolving market forces, it has been a strong year for the industry with strong sales. This speaks to the innovation and ingenuity of the industry here in Ontario and the value that Ontario's consumers see in booking with a regulated travel agency or website. While the changes happening with the travel marketplace, it's also an opportune time to look at changes to the rules that govern the industry. You may remember last, last year, uh, we, and was mentioned by Mrs. Sanborn, the, uh, the uh, new uh, act uh, strengthening Protection for Ontario Consumers Act 2017 has re received the uh, royal ass assent. The passing of that bill pa paved the way to changes to the Travel Industry Act of uh, 2002 and the Ontario Regulation uh, 05. Over the past year, there has been ongoing collaboration between TICO and the Ministry staff at reviewing the regulation with the aim of meeting the needs of both Ontario's consumer and the travel industry. We'll hear more about that process during uh, Richard's uh, remark in a few minutes. That brings me to another impact, uh, important subject, uh, strategic governance and leadership. Strong governance is step one towards TICO's success. In 2017, TICO underwent a governance review to assess our board's composition. That process led to the reduction of TICO's board from 15 to 11 directors, which will come into effect following our meeting today. The goal of the new structure is to ensure the board can continue to deliver the highest level of stewardship 
and accountability while considering efficiency and cost saving. I would like to extend my gratitude to Tico's board of directors and to our outgoing directors who have shown tremendous commitment to oversight of Tico, oversight of Tico and its important consumer protec protection mandate. I'm confident that Tico will continue to be a progressive regulator supporting a trusted marketplace where consumers are confident purchasing travel from registered professional. I encourage you to have a look at our 2019 annual report and business plan to learn a little, little bit more about Tico's accomplishment uh, in, the, in the previous uh, year and goals for the year ahead. I will now invite Richard, President and CEO, to provide an update on Tico's operation and financial statement. And uh, uh, keep your question at the end on the other business. Uh, we'll let uh, Richard present his uh, report and uh, we'll take the question at the end. Thanks, John, for those uh, remarks. Uh, it's great to be here today uh, and great to see a lot of familiar faces and a, and a few new faces. I don't know, I find the room a little bit warm today and I know we have some refreshments at the back, so please uh, feel free um, at any time during my remarks. I won't take any offense from it if you want to get up and grab a, a bottle of water or, or, or something to eat. Um, I know Jean uh, introduced a, a few of our, our guests today, but I'm equally pleased to see some other familiar faces. Um, we have our banking partners from RBC. We've got uh, legal support uh, from, from McMillan and, and from uh, Doug Crozier's firm, uh, who goes way back in the, uh, the tr in the travel industry. We've got HR support from our, our Carly, colleague uh, Darcy, and I, and I see a, a number of others. So thank you, everybody, for taking time out of busy schedules to, uh, to join us today. Um, I'll try to keep my remarks as short and brief as, as I can, but there, there is a lot to cover off. We're very proud of uh, what we've accomplished this past year, and we have a lot of work still to do. So uh, distinguished guests and esteemed colleagues, uh, good afternoon, and a uh, very warm welcome to the 2019 Travel Industry Council of Ontario's annual general meeting and to our new home uh, here at 55 Standish Court. Having completed TECO's 22nd year of operations, I'm pleased to share with you today the highlights of what we think was another successful year. We live and work in an exciting era, one in which change is a constant and where innovation is increasingly important. Our goal at TECO is to be a modern and transparent regulator. That means embracing the challenges of a complex marketplace, evolving consumer expectations, new business models, and continuous technological advancement, advancements confronted by all businesses. This ever-changing landscape of the travel industry is what makes TECO's role so important to ensure consumers remain confident with their travel purchases wherever they go, regardless of their purpose or destination. And at TECO, we're always seeking new and better ways of doing our work and achieving our mission. As a small example, today's AGM is a first for TECO, holding this important meeting at our new office location. You'll also notice that today's AGM is being recorded so that we can provide stakeholders across the province highlights of today's event. I too would like to extend a warm welcome to Michelle Sanborn, uh, and, and to thank Michelle for her uh, earlier remarks, especially under the circumstances of uh, recent days in the, in the past week. Um, we continue to work hard on a collaborative relationship with Michelle's extended team led by um, Director of Policy uh, Kelly Houston Routley and several of her team members uh, here uh, with her today. So thank you for your continued collaboration and teamwork with, uh, with my team here at uh, TECO. Um, I can tell you that uh, the team under the ministry is equally passionate about consumer protection and the strategic goals of this organization. I must also take a moment to recognize and thank our board of directors whose continued oversight, uh, commitment and contributions have helped advance TECO's mandate over the past year. More about the board a little later today as this is a significant milestone. I also have the privilege of leading a talented team at TECO who demonstrate day in and day out an unparalleled commitment towards our consumer protection mandate. I'd not be here today without their unwavering support. I also wish to express my appreciation to all our guests attending today and particularly to the heads of our associations 
whose relationship with TECO cannot be understated. So thank you once again for our strong partnership. I see Wendy and Pierre, so, and uh, I know Doug from OMCA couldn't be with us today, but thank you. Our vision and mission for TECO uh, remains poignant. Along with our core values, these important declarations guide us as we continue to grow as a team and reaffirm our commitment to consumer protection in Ontario. Operationally, TECO enjoyed several successes this year that we look forward to sharing with you today, briefly. One of the most important strategic initiatives is the continued collaboration with registrants, with industry, and with government around the comprehensive review of the Travel Industry Act in supporting regulation. Following the passing of a new bill in December 2017, we've continued advancing the recommendations previously provided to the Ministry. And recognizing the introduction of a new government just over a year ago, we've continued a meaningful dialogue with the Ministry around the importance of the following three key goals. First, to enhance consumer protection throughout the province. Two, to reduce regulatory burden on Ontario businesses. And thirdly, to seek further regulatory and regulator efficiencies. These goals are not mutually exclusive. We're equally committed to each goal, and we're actively working on initiatives around these areas. It's worth noting, too, that industry serves a critical role in the process of modernization. I'm pleased to see the role that each of our associations is undertaking. The wonderful thing about this process is that while our goals, I believe, around consumer protection are aligned, how we get to the end goal might differ. Through healthy debate, and spirited discussion, we can all be assured that the resulting legislation will reflect the insights from all stakeholders. And I'm confident that many of TECO's goals will be achieved and I'm grateful for the strong partnership we have with each of our associations and with government. However, the most common question I hear from stakeholders is when? When will this process be complete? While there's still much work to be done and an exact date unfortunately can't be confirmed at this point, the regulatory review is important for TECO and the government and with further consultation expected later this year. As always, our goal is to allow you the time needed to ensure a fair and smooth implementation and our commitment is to keep you informed along the way. I'm pleased to share with you today our financial performance for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2019. I'd like to express that with the oversight of the board and the commitment of management and all staff, we take our fiduciary responsibility to our stakeholders very seriously. Trust and transparency are critical to ensure that we maintain your confidence in TECO's financial stewardship. Financially, TECO had one of its strongest fiscal years since inception. Revenues exceeded budget expectations while operating expenses came in, came in under budget, generating a healthy net surplus for the year. TECO's audited financial statements can be found on page 41 of the annual report. Overall, our net surplus of revenues over expenses was approximately $1.9 million, an increase from the prior year's surplus of $1.5 million. And I'm pleased to report that over 80% of this surplus was directed towards the compensation fund. Total revenues grew by over 20% to over $7 million, reflecting continued growth and a healthy, resilient marketplace. This revenue growth was achieved with a static registrant base of approximately 2,360 registrants, reflecting a general decline over the years, caused by continued industry consolidation, changing industry dynamics, and new business models. Management remains prudent on expense management, seeking efficiencies while making smart investments for the future. I'm pleased to report that our total expenses were managed below our budget expectation, Operating expenses were higher than the prior year by approximately 9%, reflecting growth in our consumer awareness campaign, communications, and investments in technology. Our continued efforts to be cost conscious over expenses will remain steadfast as we recognize our commitment to efficiency and effectiveness, investments for the future, and service excellence for our registrants and consumers. Now, service excellence is not just a buzzword. We recognize it's fundamental to our existence. Our employees are dedicated to enhancing the way we do business and becoming more effective on how we serve you. This is why we're investing in technology. In recent years, we have transformed the organization to be 100% cloud-based and we've invested in collaborative tools while ensuring our IT security is at the highest standard. 
Our attention is now squarely focused on our applications and interfaces with you, our registrants. As an example, just this year we enabled um, online payments for annual registration renewals and migrated our education platform to an e-portal. Both initiatives make it easier and more efficient for registrants to work with TECO. And we're in the process of developing a portal to allow registrants faster and more accurate submissions of other documentation. So stay tuned. Just as we aim to modernize the legislation, the same applies equally to our processes. Simply put, we must become easier to work with. Last year, the value of consumer claims filed against the compensation fund was relatively low, well below the historical average. The board approved total fund payouts of approximately $328,000. The fund balance at March 31st was $23.5 million as compared to $21.7 million in 2018, an increase of $1.75 million for the year. In the past two fiscal years alone, the compensation fund has grown by $2.85 million or 14%. These contributions to the compensation fund are primarily the result of strong industry dynamics and sales and enhanced returns from our investment portfolio. While consumer claims were relatively low, TECO's regulatory compliance, claims administration, and enforcement efforts maintained a steady pace. The slide uh, behind me, and also on page 21 of your annual report, shows the operational performance metrics from the past year. While overall claims to the compensation fund were relatively low, we did experience one larger claim. This was due to Cinerama Holidays Inc., whose parent company in Quebec went bankrupt last summer. Cinerama Holidays, a TECO registrant, voluntarily surrendered its license on August 8, 2018, allowing TECO to proceed with the administration of consumer claims. In total, 5,800 Ontario consumers had their travel plans interrupted or outright cancelled. Over the past nine months, Cinerama Holidays underwent a process to develop a formal, court-approved proposal to creditors. This was done to ensure an orderly wind-down of the business and distribution of trust monies that TECO promptly froze when the business terminated. By working with a proposal trustee under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act and our existing claims administration process, we assisted 136 of those customers with imminent departures and trip completions, and after the fiscal year, further 135 customers with their claims against the compensation fund. In total, $328,000 was charged against the fund for the year, the vast majority of which was related to Cinerama. We were also able to successfully claim a recovery of approximately $166,000 from those frozen trust monies, resulting in a lower net claim against the fund. Following this process, consumers have or soon will be reimbursed from their, either their credit card company, the trustee, or by TECO's compensation fund, and this stage of the Cinerama closure is now complete. So as you can see, it was a very busy year for TECO. The fact that claims against the funds were generally lower than prior years is a testament to TECO's effective collaboration with registrants. This includes a strong inspection and overall compliance program as we keep our common goal of consumer protection clearly in our sights. One of the most important initiatives for TECO is our ongoing commitment to consumer awareness through our, our annual consumer awareness campaign. It reflects our vision and mission and quite frankly addresses the simple question, why are we here? We want to ensure consumers are aware of the underlying protections available to them, to ensure they are protected to the best of our abilities, and that Ontario is a trustworthy marketplace where consumers can confidently spend their hard-earned money on travel. At TECO, we are committed to consumer awareness and finding new and exciting ways to deliver upon this mandate. Recently, Christina Wilson has joined our team as Stakeholder Relations Manager, bringing with her a wealth of experience and knowledge with consumer awareness campaigns and more generally in strategic communications within a regulatory environment. For the first time in TECO's history, we moved to a digitally focused campaign during the year. But uh, I'm excited to introduce Christina, who will share with you some of the highlights from our recent campaign. Christina? All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Richard, and hello, everyone. As consumers increasingly turn to the internet to research and book travel, it's important for TECO to also use the same medium for its consumer awareness activities. 
So last year, the strategy was to reach consumers in the same medium they use when considering travel options and to remind them of the benefits of booking with a TECO reg registered travel agency or website. The star of the campaign was the life-sized asterisk, which represents that one missed detail that can really take a consumer's travel plans off course and highlights the value that a, reg that a registered professional can bring to the uh, to the um, process of buying travel services. You can see the asterisk displayed towards the back of the room there. The concept was brought to life through a series of three videos, which were advertised on YouTube in Toronto's PATH network, in TTC and GO transit stations, and also at Young Dundas Square. The videos were complemented by online display advertisements, social media posts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and Google search advertisements. And while the campaign was digitally focused, we also relied on some tried and true approaches to reach consumers, which included media relations, a partnership with Metroland Media, face-to-face -face interaction with consumers at events like the Outdoor Adventure Show in Toronto, and also the Travel Show in Ottawa. Now, instead of me talking about the campaign, let's watch a video with some of the highlights. Excuse me, we can't get by. Can I see your travel visas? We were never told we needed them. I'm sorry, but the giant asterisk is never wrong. I'm afraid we can't let you through. Don't let a missed detail stand in your way. You'll always know what's needed for a successful trip when you book with the Tico Registered Travel Agency or website. Visit tico.ca for more details. Now, a credit. Oh, all right. <laughs> a critical part of the campaign was measuring the impact it made. And on the slide behind me, there are some big numbers with the millions of people who've seen our videos and advertisements. But what really matters is whether we move the needle on awareness and on people's intentions. And I'm proud to report that we've done both. Before the campaign launched, we conducted a survey to determine a baseline measure for unaided awareness, meaning awareness without any prompts about what TECO is or what we do. The survey found that 14% of Ontarians could name TECO as the provincial travel regulator. After the campaign, the same survey showed that unaided awareness of TECO increased to 17.23%, a 23% increase over the baseline. And as part of our Omnibus survey, we found that individuals who saw Tico's videos and digital ads had a higher intent of booking their travel with a Tico registered travel agency or website in the future. Intent increased by six percentage points from 51% to 57%, showing a change in intended behavior. And like the highlight reel said, we are only getting started. We will continue the online awareness campaign in the year ahead with the aim of further increasing awareness of TECO and the consumer protection available when booking with a TECO registrant. Please keep an eye out for future updates as we find new ways to engage registrants as part of this awareness campaign. Our messaging asks consumers to look for the TECO logo and to ensure they are booking with a TECO registered company. So we encourage you to share the TECO logo on your storefront, on your website, or in your social media since consumers will be looking for it. Thank you for your time, and I'll now hand it back to Richard. Thank you, Christina. Um, I hope you agree that this year's digital campaign was both innovative and a sound investment that is a step in the, in the right direction. 
and we're excited to continue leveraging this approach while at the same time not abandoning more time-tried means to reach consumers that may be more comfortable with traditional approaches. As we near the end of our formal remarks, I'd like to acknowledge our Chair's comments that this AGM reflects the final time Teagle's Board will meet under its current composition of 15 directors. As you know, following the AGM, Teagle's Board will be reconstituted to 11 members consistent with best practices of corporate governance and our goal to be more effective and efficient. I'd like to take a moment to personally thank those directors uh, for their support and guidance to me over the years and to my team. Your, ex your expertise, your insights, and your strong sense of camaraderie ensured that the TECL, the TECL made meaningful progress in the pursuit of its important mandate. Very, very simply stated, thank you for everything that you've done. At TECL, we also believe in the broader social license and giving back to the community. In today's evolving world, it's simply not enough to have a focus only on a singular mandate. This is why TECL embraces its objectives around corporate social responsibility, or CSR. With the support of the board, we have apportioned a relatively small segment of our overall investment portfolio to reflect an ESG investment fo uh, investing philosophy. That is investment supportive of the environment, social fabric, and best practices in corporate governance. These investment returns, by the way, have been above market benchmarks, which goes to helping build the compensation fund even further. Internally, our employees' commitment to our broader CSR responsibility remains strong. We're very proud of our relationship with Plan Canada, who's with us today and we have a booth at the back, uh, and of our local partnership with the Mississauga Food Bank. We'll be sharing more about our CSR responsibility initiatives later in today's meeting, and we'll also hear from Plan Canada about how TECL's contribution helps children around the world. Before I close out my remarks, I want to draw your attention to our annual report and business plan, which you received in your bags today. It's a helpful publication that describes our activities and our important role in consumer protection. We remain strategically focused on three overarching priorities, consumer protection, awareness and education, and organizational effectiveness. While legislative reform is central to this plan, there are many other objectives identified as we strive to achieve our overall vision mission. We've included our three-year business plans, financial projections, which reflect continued strong fiduciary management, these projections do not reflect the possible legislative changes now underway as we enter these final stages of consultation and dialogue with the Ministry. But in closing, I'd like to say it was a busy and challenging year. With both ups and, and, and some downs, um, we must and we will remain razor focused on our goal to continue as a modern regulator and the mandate entrusted to us by government. There's incredible passion and ingenuity by government, industry and TECOL for ensuring the, cons the consumer experience is both positive and protected. It's not just good public policy, it's, it's good business. Although well, change is a constant, I'm confident that the travel industry has a bright future ahead. Together, industry, government, and TECO can and must ensure a balance between innovation and good business practices with a modern consumer protection model that ensures consumers remain confident in their travel purchase. And now it's time to move to our financial statements and our auditor's report. So uh, an audit of Teagle's financial statements was conducted. The auditor's report is included with the financial statements in the 2019 annual report and business plan. Management's responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of financial statements in accordance with Canadian accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations. The auditor's responsibility is to express an opinion on these financial statements based on their audit. It is the auditor's opinion that the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of TECL as of March 31, 2019 and its financial performance and its cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with Canadian accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations. TECL's financial statements can be found beginning on page 41 of the annual report. Are there any questions on the financial statements? Surprise. Okay. Seeing that there are none, I'd like to invite Jean back up to the stage for the auditor's report. Jean? Yeah. We have with us uh, tonight uh, Rob Wells from BDO. He's here uh, today. 
Uh, and uh, I have to ask the question if uh, anyone wants the auditor to read his report or can I have a motion to dispense with the reading of the auditor's report? Can I have a motion or motion moved by uh, Rick Edwards to dispense uh, with uh, the reading of the uh, auditor's report, seconded by Mark Petri. I have to ask all those in favor, raise your card. Anyone opposed? Motion carried. Does anyone have uh, any question to, uh, for the uh, auditor? No question, none. Okay, so um, I will move on the next item on the uh, agenda, which is the appointment of the uh, auditors for next year. And uh, are there any question about, in fact, the next item of business is the appointment of the auditor for next year. And the uh, TICO Board of Directors is recommending BDO Canada uh, as TICO auditors for 2019 and 2020. Are there any questions uh, about BDO before I seek a motion? No question. So could I have a motion to retain BDO Canada as auditors and authorizing the board of directors to fix the auditor's re remuneration? Do I have a motion? Louise, sorry, to retain uh, BDO Canada as auditors for and to authorize the board of directors to fix the auditor's remuneration, seconded by Brett Walker. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? None. Motion carried. Now, uh, I will proceed under item uh, seven to the announcement of the composition of the new TICO board. At last year's annual general meeting, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, bylaw amendments were approved to reduce the size of the TICO board from 15 to 11. Those changes will take effect today. So the new TICO board for 2019 and 2020 will be as follows. The two directors named by ACTA are Mike Forster and Sherry Scott. Can you please stand up, Mike, Sherry Scott? <laughs> Congratulations, Wel welcome aboard. The two directors named by Cato are Nicole Bercy and Rich Rick Edwards. <laughs> welcome back. The directors named by the Ontario Motor Coach Association is Ted Goldenberg. I think that Ted couldn't make it tonight. Uh, the two elected directors are Mac Mark Patry and Robert Thompson. <laughs> Robert uh, is not here with us tonight. The four individuals appointed by the Minister of Government and Consumer Services are Jan McMillan, <laughs> Scott Stewart, <laughs> Leanna Villela, <laughs> and uh, myself, Jean Hébert. <laughs> so on behalf of the board and management, I, wa I want to welcome <laughs> Sherry, <laughs> Sherry Scott, tell Goldenberg and Lena Villela. And I'd like to welcome back Scott, uh, who was previously an, an elected director. Scott is uh, on the board for many years and uh, brings a valuable contribution for sure. We look forward to working with you over the next year, all of you. Now, uh, I would like, we would like to thank those board members who departed over the last uh, year. And I invite our ongoing board members to come up to the stage 
please join me when I call your name. Louise Gardiner, who most, uh, who most recently served on the Audit Technology and Risk Management Committee and was a past chair of the Business Strategy Committee. Louise, thank you very much for your contribution to the TICO organization. Lorraine Nawina, who most uh, recently chaired the Governance and Human Resources Committee and who also served on the Legislative Regulatory Modernization Committee. Thank you, Lorraine. You will be missed. Uh, the other one is Brett Walker, who was our most recent vice chair and served on the Legislative and Regulatory uh, Modernization Committee <laughs> and the Business Strategy Committee. To you as well, Brett, thank you very much for your contribution. And uh, maybe I should. Uh, Now I would like to invite Richard back to the stage to share more about TICO's Corporate Social Responsibility Initiatives, which will be followed by other business in our question and answers session. Richard. Thank you. Uh, just before I move to other business, I, I know we recognize that our, our board members that are uh, departing from the board today. Uh, there are some who could not join us today, and I just wanted to uh, recognize them as well. Uh, Katera Akberry, who served on our Audit Technology and Risk Management Committee. Jim Diebel, uh, who served on our Governance and HR Committee and the Legislative and Regulatory Modernization Committee. Warren Kenneratnam, who was on our Audit Technology uh, Committee. And Richard Vanderlube, uh, who was a past chair of the TECO Board and most, ser most recently served as a chair of the Business Strategy Committee and was also chair of the Legs and Regu Regulatory Modernization Committee. Couldn't be with us today, but we do recognize and thank them for their service as well. So uh, we're on our home stretch, folks, promise. Um, TICO had an important goal uh, this year of raising $5,000 for Plan Canada, and we're proud to announce that we exceeded that goal. Um, our employees creatively raised uh, funds through gene days, cook-offs, and, and various sales. Um, they also give back to the community in other non-monetary ways. By supporting Plan Canada's match gift programs, where monetary donations were matched five to one by government and foundations, we were able to equip two schools, install a water system, contribute to 35 other gifts promoting health care, literacy, and education. But uh, better to hear this from um, right from the source. So I'd like to invite uh, Lauren Adams, Plan Canada's manager of corporate partnerships, to tell us a little bit more about Plan Canada's mission and, and how our uh, contributions made a, a difference. So Lauren. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. It's been great to have TECO support over the last few years. I know this year was a little bit different in terms of choosing gifts of hope over community sponsorship. So thank you for being flexible and kind of looking at new ways to give back. Um, so I'm actually going to kick things off with a quick video to kind of show you what our new master brand is all about. It's called Define Normal. Um, so for those of you that may not know us, Plant International, we are an international development organization striving to ad advance the rights of children and equality for girls. So we'll start with the video. Humans are capable of some amazing feats. We've charted the stars, split the atom, and hold the entire world in our hands. We've rewritten the meaning of possible a thousand times over. But for all our advances, we've also left millions of children behind. Especially girls. And people have accepted that this, this is normal. That normal is turning a blind eye. Normal is denying us our potential. Normal 
is a world where only boys go to school and girls are forced into marriage. Normal is accepting that children don't have rights and that girls are denied equality, that we should be denied our voices. Yet, who better to speak out against normal than us? When others say can't, children say will. When we all challenge normal, incredible things happen. Girls everywhere can go to school. Children can change their futures and make a difference in their communities. Plan International helps all of us challenge normal again and again, so that together we can advance children's rights, promote equality for girls, and unleash everyone's potential. So, how do you get involved? Simple. Join us and defy normal. So as already stated, this year Tico was able to raise just over $5,000 to support our international programming. And because of our matching partners, that has over $30,000 worth of impact. So it was great to see such a wide variety of gifts of hope were chosen by staff this year, some of which included medicine for moms and babies, bed nets for families, school essentials for an entire classroom, hygiene kit for girls, newborn checkups, buzzing bees, sheeps, goats, uh, to name a few. So I want to share just specifically an example or two of how this has a true impact in our uh, program countries. So the thousand dollars that was donated towards water and sanitation was actually bringing water to a community in Tanzania. So in Tanzania, less than 25% of the population have access to proper sanitation. So through this donation, rural communities across the country will be provided with further access. So this gift of hope alone is providing 38,000 people with access to improved latrines and has made it possible for over 250,000 people to perform crucial hygiene practices like hand washing with soap and clean water. And collectively, this gift has helped to improve health and save lives by stopping the spread of waterborne illness. In October of last year, I was fortunate enough to travel with our organization to Tanzania and visit some of the programs myself alongside some of our donors. So as much as it might not necessarily resonate to hear about hand washing practices, because that's something we're all very much accustomed to here in Canada, it was incredible to see the excitement in the children's faces, demonstrating by singing a song how to properly wash their hands. So one of the programs that had been implemented in the specific community was the development of um, washrooms and it was incredible to hear the kids talking about how they're going to maintain the washroom, what they need to do to kind of take care of it and make sure everyone has safe access to using a washroom. And so these little things that we sometimes take for granted here at home because we are fortunate to have our basic human rights met are really life-changing in these communities internationally. As mentioned, we have a booth at the back, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more, I'll stick around and I'd be happy to chat. Um, and this last slide is just highlighting some of the impacts from our Gifts of Hope program overall. So you may be familiar with the Buy Goat, which is where the kind of initial Gift of Hope started from. Um, and there's a diverse range of items that you can purchase. And this is a great opportunity to kind of engage your families uh, around the Christmas season. It's a really popular gift. Um, so just a couple of things to highlight is that over 140,000 children were provided classroom essentials through the Gifts of Hope program. Over 3,000 tons in food baskets were delivered. And over 1.1 million girls were reached through our Girl Power initiative, which is essentially providing access to those in our program countries. So thank you very much to Tico and the whole team for all of your support. And I look forward to continuing to work with you all. So uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, very, very compelling. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Tim Snell and Susie Janko to the stage. Tim and Susie are the co-chairs of Tico's Corporate Social Responsibility Committee. And on behalf of all the staff at TECO, we'd like uh, Lauren to present you with a, a check for $5,182, representing TECO's fundraising efforts for this past year. Okay. 
So I hope I hope you have the opportunity to visit the plan, our Plan Canada table at the back of the room to learn more about the vital role this organization represents to children around the world and, and within Canada. Now I'd like to hand it back the meeting to Jean for uh, closing remarks. So it's time for me to invite you and to thank you for being so quiet so far. I don't invite you to dance, but I invite you to raise any points or question that you may have. We have a solid team who can respond, answer your question. Any question? No comments? Yes, Pierre. I'm Pierre Lepage with the Canadian Association of Tour Operators. And it's probably more a comment, really, well, rather a statement or, or actually a comment on, uh, first of all, congratulations on a very successful year, obviously, and it's very, and TICO is very well run. And uh, whether, regardless of the number of members, we do represent the tour operators in, in Ontario. And um, whether everyone is aware or not, and I think uh, Wendy will agree that uh, both TICO and our Cato, rather, and ACTA are involved in lobbying efforts in actually trying to improve the funding method for the compensation fund. Um, we know that for many years, TICO has been actively involved in trying to finance itself in a different way. I remember sitting on a committee many years ago uh, that was actually at the time called Alternative Financing, whose principal responsibility, and I see other members who were there, Mike Foster, uh, Richard Vanderloop, who was not there, who's not here today, but several of us, uh, Jeff Element was actually the uh, chair of the, that committee for many years. Uh, so our responsibility has always been, and we've always seen from a tour operator's point of view that although the original intent of the compensation fund was laudable, but with the evolution of the industry and the business, it has become remarkably inadequate. So our responsibility has been to lobby. We have spent the last six months in a substantial amount of funds lobbying, trying to get to the government to make the necessary changes. Uh, we are very respectful, respectful of the fact that uh, the government is involved, and, and so is TICO, in trying to reduce the bur uh, redu re regulatory burden, rather. Our view is it should also include reduce financial burden because registrants across the province are the only ones who have been funding all of TICO all the time, all along. And the compensation fund has over the years become a lion's share of the total funding of TICO. So not only are the registrants expected to pay their registration fees, but they are also need to contribute into the compensation fund over and over again. The reality is roughly $4 million of that annually comes from uh, what I don't see the term compensation fund contributions, which is what it actually is. Um, so for our, res our responsibility as associations, both ACTA, and I think I speak on behalf of Wendy as well, and she may want to add comments as well, we just feel that, that things really need to be changed. Unfortunately, we went through many levels of consultations in tr changing the regulations, et cetera, and the most important one, which was not included, was the inclusion of compensation fund contributions by consumers themselves. There was an actuarial study that was uh, requested and paid for by TICO. And of course, it concluded exactly what we always thought should be the case, that should be, there should be more money in the fund, there should be contributions from consumers, and it should happen to the, to the level at least to at least compare a little bit to our neighbors next door in Quebec who have reached a level where the fund is obviously covering everything. The problem being that the, comp the caps, limits, restrictions, and requirements are onerous on, on registrants. 
a thought occurred to me earlier in the conversation that was that really Visa and MasterCard should be here because they are the they are primarily responsible for con consumer co compensation fund cons or or consumer protection in Ontario because the fund is the payer of last resort and we don't believe that that is correct there are so many caps limits so many per person failure or based on the number of uh, of individuals consumers are actually having to wait sometimes six months before they can even find out if they're, they might get any funds back. So I think that uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that all of the retailers and tour operators in the audience are aware that lobbying efforts have been going on and will probably have to take a recess because the government is doing so for the next five months. So consequently, uh, it's a bit of a problem for, from our perspective and it's a bit of a disappointment because we feel that we've come to a situation where maybe we've spent a lot of money for not a whole lot of result. So just to bring you up to date as far as everyone is concerned. Wendy, if you have any comments, please do. Thank you. Hi, I'm the president of ACTA, the Association of Canadian Travel Agencies. When I look around the room, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. And um, so, uh, so many of us have uh, been working on the Travel Industry Act uh, review and update um, quite um, actively for three years now. I cannot express to our government representatives the amount of time money and resources that we have spent over the last three years to get the attention of the Ontario government. Uh, we, on behalf, uh, on behalf of travel agencies in Ontario, along with Cato um, tour operators, um, that we have had no less than 20 meetings in the last um, six months with government officials trying to express the sheer frustrations of business in Ontario and the burden that we have financially um, with the Travel Industry Act and the uh, administrative burden of trying to run a travel agency, whether it's a small business or a large business, due to the number of uh, legislation and regulations. Um, so here we are, um, three years later, and in the last year, we, have, we are now on our third minister in this um, uh, uh, ministry, and um, we are frustrated in that we cannot get any movement. Um, we go to consultation after consultation, and what we feel from a travel agency perspective is that what we're getting is more regulation and more burden. And so we ask you that are here today um, to please take note of this. Um, the government or the politicians may be on break for the next few months, but we are not. Our next meeting is within the next two weeks. We will not stop our lobbying for fairness for Ontario businesses. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madame Paradis. Just a final point of clarification, sorry. Um, the reality is that I am aware, of course, and we are all, we've all been presented with a, uh, a social media uh, publicity campaign. The fact, is, the fact is that all Ontario registrants must, by, man, or by mandate, contribute and to fund TICO and the compensation fund. The reality is because of the situation that which has evolved we're talking this began in the days when people would only go to their travel agent which was the only source for travel information now travel information is rampant over the internet and so is the ability the ability to book with anyone so all ontario registrants are burdened with the financial responsibility of having to fund TICO, the compensation fund, et cetera, which effectively puts them at a competitive disadvantage to all of their competitors, the majority of which, of which contribute nothing to any compensation fund. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I can uh, certainly uh, say uh, at least that uh, we understand your concerns. 
and uh, we understand the issues. And uh, we also had the opportunity to raise uh, this concern and issues uh, with the uh, minister uh, at a few uh, occasions. And uh, we'll also do so with the new minister, for sure. Uh, you have brought the uh, concept of the uh, consumer contribution uh, in this uh, compensation fund. And uh, it's, uh, I, I would say, uh, it's fair to talk about that. We have addressed, uh, we have talked about this uh, concept for a few years, but uh, um, I will stick to the, uh, and I'm by nature always optimistic, even realistic as well. But I will stick to the uh, response that we received from the minister uh, not later than in April, if I remember, or around April. We're saying that let's fix the uh, regulatory uh, development at this point of time, and then we'll address this issue of the compensation fund. And uh, addressing the issue of the compensation fund, from my point of view, is to consider all the option. And uh, all the option includes, from my point of view, again, uh, the uh, consumer uh, contribution concept. And I think that uh, <coughs> it is part of the solution, uh, from my uh, point of view. And, uh, but, you know, uh, I think that we, we, we'll, we'll see over the next uh, few months <coughs> what can be the outcome of that. And uh, I think that uh, in your campaign, of your lobbying campaign, uh, you can also uh, know that, and you know that uh, uh, we uh, are supportive of what you are doing uh, right now, and, uh, but supportive uh, in a sense that uh, you have to make your representation, and uh, we have a role to play, and uh, we play each other our respective role, and at the end of the process, uh, hopefully we'll uh, have some, any kind of improvements, and there is always room for improvements. So, uh, unless, Richard, you want to add anything on that? Uh, no, I, I think the points we made very clear. Yeah, okay. Any other questions or? No. So we are now uh, at the end of our meeting, and I would like to thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you again next year, or even before that. Uh, and uh, feel free to contact Tico. Uh, they are there to uh, respond to your uh, question, concern, concern, not only at the AGM, but all the time. And uh, Thanks again, and now I will ask uh, a motion to uh, conclude our uh, meeting, a motion to move to adjourn our meeting, moved by Lorraine Nowina, seconder, no, we don't need. So thank you again, and see you soon or next year. <laughs>